Jennifer, the lawmaker has filed a bill to do away with some of the hurdles that people may face in trying to get an order of protection. He tells me that it's in response to what happened to Taylor, and he believes that it will save lives. The tragic killing of 29-year-old Taylor McFadden Robinson of Florence touched the heart of Williamsburg County Representative Caesar McKnight. Taylor's husband, 31-year-old Duncan Robinson Jr., is charged in her death last month at her home in Florence. South Carolina ranked sixth worst in the nation for women killed by men, according to FBI data. I personally know at least nine women who have died at the hands of domestic violence. And it's sort of one of those things where you just sit there and you're like, well, what can we do? So he filed a bill that would make it easier for people to get an order of protection. And when I heard about the difficulty she had getting an order of protection, it, it just dawned on me that we need to streamline the process and make it easier for people who are victims of domestic violence to get some sort of protection uh, from, from the courts. Court records show Taylor filed for the protection order last March in Florence County Family Court. We got a copy of the order. Taylor wrote that her husband tried to run over her with his car, kicked in a door at her home, refused to leave her house, and tried to fight a contractor on her property. She said all of this happened in a span of 14 days. The order says the judge denied Taylor's request due to failure to prove facts of alleged abuse. Right now, you have to go through family court to get an order of protection. McKnight says his bill gives magistrates the power to issue the orders without consulting the other spouse or a significant other. I have a daughter, I have friends, and I don't, I don't want them to ever be in a situation where they can't protect themselves or get protection where they're being victimized. McKnight tells me that he is optimistic that his bill will pass and become law by the end of the legislative session in June. The Marion County town has been reelected to lead the community, even after he had been convicted of mail fraud. Frank Jones beat incumbent mayor Barbara Hopkins to be the new mayor of Sellers. Election officials say he had 56 votes to Hopkins 30. Back in 1998, Jones was convicted of mail fraud while serving as the mayor of Sellers. He spent three years in federal prison. Jones says he never committed mail fraud, but just didn't have the money to fight it. Everybody that gets convicted in a courtroom is not guilty. And you can believe that is not guilty. If I would have had the money and could have had proper representation, it would have been the other way. Around sellers, what are your plans? State election officials say Jones can hold office because his conviction and completion of his prison sentence was more than 15 years ago. Jones says he was a certified police officer for 25 years and an honest man. He says the past is the past and he's ready to do big things for sellers. People aren't just so right now let's pin in on the Myrtle Beach area where since March 2020 the rent growth price has gone up roughly 30 percent since the pandemic and that's more than any other metro area in the Palmetto State. People are struggling. The people here are struggling. The cost of living in Myrtle Beach is reaching new heights. We're seeing that the uh, pricing uh, for rentals as well as home ownership has really skyrocketed and putting a lot of upward pressure on, to, on the, on the uh, housing market. It's putting pressure on those who help renters in need. Julie Meany oversees rental assistance data and applications at the Eastern Carolina Housing Organization. Folks that applied and received assistance because they were facing eviction in August are representing now for more assistance because their rents have gone up. An increase that's impacting a variety of households. New numbers from apartmentlist.com, which uses census and HUD data, finds the average rentals are 200 to $400 more compared to February 2020 in Myrtle Beach. Echo sees 25 to 30 applicants a week, and they've already pumped more than $7 million into the market to help renters. I don't see how the problem doesn't just continue to grow until we address affordable housing. That's what Jason Green with the local Habitat for Humanity is working towards. He sent recommendations to Myrtle Beach City Council for more workforce housing in city limits. We're, we're calling it attainable housing because it runs the entire spectrum of income relative to making housing affordable. We're now 
And Green says that plan will recommend that the city strive to work with developers to build roughly 200 new units annually that are affordable for seasonal workers. The data was displayed this month and Green says that will now begin the process for city leaders to take action to address housing here. Jen, I absolutely did and all of it was amazing and just like you saw a few of those things right there. But after serving up that home style cooking for nearly a decade, Michael Chestnut, the owner of Big Mike's Soul Food, says he was nervous at the beginning of the pandemic. He says he wasn't sure if their family owned and operated business would survive. Michael Chestnut says he and his wife wanted to bring a little soul back into the Myrtle Beach community after the closing of Miss Francis Place. I like to help people. Soul food is food that you really put your, your love into it and you take your time and do it right. And Chestnut says they always season it just right. The secret behind their home style flavors? Chestnut says while they use traditional but secret seasonings, they put their own spin on how they make these southern classics. People also use... Um, 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 I guess you would say like fat back or ham hocks, neck bones and stuff. Actually, we don't because a lot of people are so health conscious now. So we don't even, even put any meat in our, in our vegetables. I can attest it doesn't take away from the flavor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But something Chestnut never thought he'd get a taste of, a global pandemic threatening to close their doors. He says thankfully Big Mike's qualified and received a Paycheck Protection Program loan. The loan's made available by the first National CARES Act in 2020. And with this financial help, Chestnut says while one door closed, a window opened. You'd be amazed at how many people come to that little window there. To, and, and they'll call online and place their order online. We'll have it ready when they get here. So some people are still, you know, they like to just get in and take it home and sit back. I get calls from people all the time saying, how old Mike, we enjoyed the food. You know, so that makes you feel real good that you're doing something right. But he says the employees were truly the heart and soul that kept the restaurant alive. We've got some of the same employees who've been here with us in the whole 10 years, you know, now. And, and I, I think is we survived just by our employees being willing to work with us and saying, hey, we want to make it back to where we were. And here we are. Get ready for 22. And like Jen said earlier, they're not just surviving over at Big Mike's. They're thriving as well. And they were recently featured in Southern Living for their chicken bog.